Okay. Um, my name is Justin Wilson. I own a consulting company called MTIN.net. Um, I'm also the uh, chief operating officer for an internet exchange called Midwest Internet Exchange. Uh, I've been doing ISP stuff since uh, about 1993, so I've I've been in the the business quite a bit. Um, you know, it's a little little why you should care. Um, you know, I'm I'm an active member of the the Brothers Wisp podcast. If how many people listen to us kind of ramble on, awesome. That's what I like to hear. Um, I've owned and operated several ISPs. Um, our last one we sold two years ago this month. A um, little fun fact about me, I'm a huge G.I. Joe collector, so I can always be bribed with little, little plastic toys. <laughs> okay, let me figure this, this dude out here. There we go. Okay, so today we're going to talk about uh, three, three different topics. Um, as, as I was kind of preparing for this, every time I do a, a presentation, I, I kind of like to do a general topic just so I can get in on a presentation. So as, as, as it gets nearer and nearer, I kind of listen to what a lot of the forums are talking about, what, what people are talking about. So one of the themes that I, I've been hearing about is NAT. Um, you know, I'm, I'm being double natted, I'm being triple natted, and then I hear a lot of people say, well, I'm going to do carrier grade NAT. So what is carrier grade NAT and should you even do it? And then another thing is, is BGP. So, you know, I'm, I'm of the, the mind that I want to give you, you all um, stuff that you can implement and will help your business right away. So, you know, just stuff to think about when you're at the airport or sending in traffic or, you know, waiting to go home. So why do we NAT? And uh, who do we NAT? You know, we don't want to NAT everybody. Um, so NAT isn't bad. You know, the, the previous uh, speaker was talking about IPv6 and, um, you know, how IPv6 is going to help us and everything. But a lot of people aren't there by the, the show of hands that I saw. You know, not, not everybody's there. Um, so you're still stuck in the IPv4 world. So whether that is, you know, you're doing uh, private IPs to all your customers or you're doing, um, you know, publics to your customers and you're out of space. So IPv4 space, it's, it's scarce. And if you want to buy it on the open market, it's scarce and it's expensive. Um, of course, IPv6 is slow to be adopted. Um, and another thing I kind of hear folks say, well, since I'm natting my customers, they're secure. Well, security by obscurity is not security. So, what's the, uh, what's the best, most likely scenario that a lot of ISPs I see are running into? It's the triple nat threat. And my little picture over here is just because it's Texas, you know. Um, so, I, I go into some of these networks and one of the first things that we, we tend to uncover is, okay, I'm natting at the edge. I got a uh, CPE that's in router mode. That's, that's natting my customer. And then my customer has a router. So, you know, right there, you're, you're kind of uh, a triple whammy. Um, if anybody has, has seen this guy or talked to this guy, you know what I'm talking about. You know, this, this is the, the call I always hated. Well, my, my Xbox says, I got this restricted NAT. You guys are evil. And it's usually this guy on the other end of the line. So you, you all know what I'm talking about. So how do we, how do we make that better even if, the, um, even if it's not better? How do we make this guy happier? Well, one of the tricks we always came up with was a DMZ NAT. Microtech supports it. A lot of other places support it. Um, you, uh, a DMZ, if you don't know what a DMZ is, it forwards all the ports from your WAN address to, your, to a private address. So even if you don't have publics that you're handing out to the customers, you can still do this trick and make things like the Xbox restricted NAT better and just you know, make the, the customer 
at least appear that things are better for them. So one, one trick we always do is we set up a DHCP server on the LAN side of the, the device, and we have that DHCP server just hand out one address. That one address is the IP that we put in the, the DMZ. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing a router-based CPE or if you're doing a, uh, you know, a managed router for the customer, you can, you can still do this. And it's a, it's a very hands-off approach because you don't have to say, well, you need to set your IP to this IP to be in the DMZ. You, you need to do all these things. No, just plug in your new device, reboot the radio. That new device will get a, a new DHCP address. So now this is, this is the one I wanted to spend a little bit of time on because this is one that I think will, will help a lot of folks a one-to-many NAT. So I'm going I'm to go to this next slide and kind of explain what's going on here. And we'll, we'll get into some of the, the goodies about this. So we have two tower sites here. Um, each one of these tower sites has some public IPs assigned to the router. So, so in tower one here, you know, one, two, three ones are, are, are public. One, two, three, nine is our next public. So what we're doing with this one-to-many NAT is we're taking all the customers from this tower that may have a 10.1.2. whatever address, and we are sending them out their gateway, but we're doing a one-to-many NAT. So when they go to whatismyip.com, it shows up as 123.1. Now, this is a nice way to conserve a lot of your IPv4 space, but at the same time, you can do away with a lot of the, you know, the Roku box issues, um, some of the VoIP issues, some things like that. Now, this this isn't a it, it, it isn't a direct replacement for IPv4 um, to every customer, but it's a nice in the in the middle way. I'm recommending this to quite a bit of people uh, who are running out of space or who want to conserve space. And they're like, well, we don't want to buy space on the open market, but we don't, we don't want to go to IPv6 right now because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work involved. So if I go back here, you know, this is, this is easy to implement. You can do it on a per tower basis. You can do it on a per sector basis if you're handing out IPs. I, I know folks who are doing uh, routed, routed networks per sector. Um, you can drop this in anywhere, anywhere um, that makes sense to you and it's not a disruption. It's all done on the, the service provider end. Um, and I've, I've kind of started using the, the term NAT domains. It splits up your, your NAT domains because when you're doing NAT, it's all about ports. You want port 3074 open for Xbox. You want port 5060 open for SIP. Um, so you're, you're breaking up these domains where say you have, you know, uh, Say you have 30 customers on this tower and 20 of them are Xbox customers. Well, they're all competing for port 3074. So NAT in its wisdom is going to try to work that out the most. Now over here, if you have another 20 Xbox customers, by doing the one to many NAT, you've isolated these these customers from these customers as far as going out port, you know, 3074. So how, how do we do a one-to-many NAT? Um, it's pretty simple. Uh, on the very basic levels, you use a, a source NAT. Uh, here's, our, here's our private network over here. We've designated the, the network itself, and we've designated our, our public address here. So it's, it, it can be a little more complicated than that, but that's how you get whatismyip.com to show that they're coming from 2.2.2.3. Any, any questions on, on that so far? 
It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward, nice way to, uh, you know, break up your, your NAT domains. So now, how do, I, who, how do I put this in practice with the IPs that I have? And this is, this is one thing that, that we kind of did. We routed a 29 to most of our towers. Now, this is where it can be a little flexible because you may have a tower that says, hey, I'm going to do maybe 10, 10 public addresses on this tower. Well, then you want to route something bigger. 29 is, is usually the smallest I'd, I'd route for, for this type of setup. So this gives us six usable IP addresses. What we would do is the first, you know, the dot one or the first usable address would be for our customer gateway. Now I define this as if I hand a customer 1.3.2 or 1.2.3.2, they're going to go out this IP address. Now, I would always take the last usable IP address, in, in our example case, 1.2.3.6, and I would use that for our one-to-many NAT. That way I'm not wasting IP addresses, I'm not sharing between these customers and my, you know, 10 dot whatever customers, they're, they're not intermixing. So now, I can, I can give each tower uh, a public address that my you know, private customers can go out. So now, the biggest, the biggest thing I've been hearing is carrier grade NAT. I need to go to carrier grade NAT. What is it? How, how is it different? You've, you've probably heard a lot of terms, you know, CGN is carrier grade NAT, NAT 444 versus 44. It's all about these RFCs. If you're, if you're folks who like to, to read RFCs, this explains a lot. Um, and they're, they're not really that bad of a read either. They're, they're pretty straightforward. They define a lot of what's going on. Um, and so if you're looking at defining and implementing carrier grade NAT, know your RFCs. Um, hopefully, I might talk some of you out of doing carrier grade NAT. How, how many people are considering or doing carrier grade NAT? Okay, a couple. Um, for those who raise your hand, are you just considering it or are you doing it? Okay, are you doing it on Microtech? Okay, and what, what's your rationale why? Okay. 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 And did you pick carrier grade NAT versus just normal NAT for a reason or? Yeah. Okay. So that's 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 what I hear from a lot of people. You know, it's carrier grade NAT is. If you follow the RFCs, you have to use very certain IP space. You have to do it in a ver you have to do the natting in a very certain way. Um, it's it's nat, but it's nat for people who I don't want to say have been listening to the sales speak, but it's 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 not an end all solution. So you have some pretty big disadvantages to carrier grade NAT. Um, compared to normal NAT, it is more CPU and memory intensive. Uh, you, port forwarding is no longer an option with carrier grade NAT. So you can't pick and choose what ports that you're forwarding. Um, and carrier grade NAT was, kind of came up with to help people transition to IPv6. So most of the, the people that I've, I've worked with, uh, a lot of them being telephone companies, they've been sold by their DSL vendor or whatever, hey, you need to go to carrier grade NAT before you go to IPv6. Well, what typically happens is they just go to IPv6 anyway. So it's still NAT. You still have multiple people behind a single address. Um, you still have issues with services seeing too many IP addresses. So, what are the advantages? I'm not going to sell you on carrier grade NAT. Um, 
It's easier than IPv6. Um, it's still NAT. It's a very specific way of doing NAT. So, you know, it's, it's a more defined way of doing NAT um, because it was geared toward, hey, I'm a, I'm a carrier. You know, I'm a AT&T, I'm a Verizon. I need something that is, quote, carrier grade. So that's, that's how the whole carrier grade stuff came up with. Um, so there's better things than carrier grade NAT. So as I said earlier, you know, go to IPv6. If you're gonna spend money and resources, just go to IPv6. Skip doing carrier grade NAT, because if you're doing NAT right now, just tweak that NAT. So, you know, most of these are, are IPv6 stuff. You know, dual stack, NAT64, again, another NAT um, method, but it's using IPv6, DS Lite, and, you know, 6RD. So, kind of kind of staying with the the whole NAT theme, um, universal plug and play. It gets a pretty bad rep, um, mainly because the Linksys's, the D Links, a lot of those people of the world didn't implement it with security in mind. So, for all of the the, the people running Microtech out here. Um, Microtech has addressed one of the biggest vulnerabilities with universal plug and play. You can disable it on your external interfaces. So, you know, that's where a lot of other vendors kind of go wrong. They just, hey, universal plug and play is enabled, have fun at it. And if, if you do some Google search, most of the vulnerabilities, most of the, the published um, exploits, they're a couple years old. So, yes, it is something that's a little more insecure than having it disabled, but the benefits of it are, you know, pretty much outweigh it. So, a lot, a lot of operators feel like they're, they're kind of giving up control with universal plug and play. So, like Brian Horn earlier was talking about you know, the managed microtics that they, uh, they provide to the customers. Excellent use of universal plug and play if you want to implement it at that point. Um, since you have control over the router, you can patch it. You can say, hey, uh, I'm going to do things like, you know, simply not allow it on the external interfaces. Um, you you can make yourself kind of a hero because of um, you know the Xbox people we mentioned earlier um, and one of the shifts a lot of providers are kind of going toward is security costs us money um, that that can be both ways it costs us money to implement security it costs us money not to implement security so if you're getting customers hacked with out-of-date firmware and things like that, you know, manage router, you know, with universal plug and play that you control might be a really nice tool for you. So here's here's a here's a shot from my home Microtech. I have an Xbox One. Um, I, I just turned on universal plug and play secured it with that um, little little bit of code that I showed you earlier, and away I went. So my Xbox One at home, I, I do have a public address, but my NAT level went from moderate to open with universal plug and play, uh, just because it, it adds these, these bits of code in and you know some, some magic happens. So if I was providing this to some ISP customers, all of a sudden, I have all these Xbox gamers that, you know, they went from a restricted to a moderate NAT um, or a moderate to an open NAT, and they're like, woohoo, you know, and they're, they, they don't know what that really does, but it's good. So any, any questions on universal plug and play? Okay. 
So BGP, how many people are struggling with, with some of their BGP implementations? Or how many people are, you know, kind of, I, I, want, I want my BGP better. Um, so BGP comes down to a couple, couple different considerations. Design and engineering is, is your foundation. Well, we'll talk about that a little. Um, your setups with your peers, that's your, your biggest thing. Um, and then filters and security. And we won't, we won't talk about much security because Mr. Tom Smith, rock star up there, give us a wave, Tom, is, has a very, listen to his presentation if you're, you're talking about uh, filters and security. So our approach to BGP. Everything starts with a good foundation. You have a modular approach, redundancy and security, and the three-tier design. I think Cisco or somebody came up with the three-tier design years ago. Um, if you've ever gone through any of their classes, they, they preach this quite heavily these days. So here's, here's a, a typical small BGP setup that we, we like to see. So we have a, a BGP speaker up here talking to one or two different ISPs. And then we have another, another separate physical hardware talking to uh, another couple ISPs. And you can get as crazy with this as you want. Um, you can load up four or five uh, speakers on this one, you know, a couple on this one, or you can have you know, a uh, speaker per router board. Um, sales Giannis would, would love you for this. Um, then you, you mix them into a couple core routers. Uh, one of the things, as, as you grow your BGP feeds, you're wanting uh, full routes. So one of, the, one of the problems a lot of people run into is, hey, I'm taking in full routes from four or five or more ISPs, and I need a really beefy router that can handle that. Um, my convergence time, the time it takes me to drop one peer and for all my routes to calculate, that gets longer and longer. Um, and this really becomes an issue the more and more different uh, providers you, you, you mix in. So we have, a, we have our two core routers here. They're receiving full routes from our, uh, from our BGP speakers. And then down here is our, our customer network. So these two are the ones that the, the customers talk to. Um, and they're, they're in a redundant type of, of fashion. Uh, you can do IBGP between the two of them. You can do OSPF between the two of them. You know, it's pretty, pretty flexible. So why, why is this a good thing? Why is this a cool thing? Well, if we want to upgrade our BGP speaker one here, we can just pretty much take it offline. The rest of the network is going to flow through these, these other ISPs and out this router board here. So we can do upgrades on this. We can do testing on this. Say you got a, a new router OS version that has some super cool BGP features you want to use. You can try it on this one without really taking down the production network. And you can say, hey, I'm only going to advertise maybe one of my prefixes out this one and everything else goes out the other router board. So when you're, when you're talking you know, a modular design like this, you're able to give yourself a whole lot of flexibility. Um, hey, Tom. When you reboot one of your routers, how long is your convergence time right now? What's that? For, for, for your exchange stuff, for, for BGP? Yeah, okay. And so, so you're, you're able to distribute some of your horsepower, you're able to distribute some of your management load, you're, you're able to distribute a lot across a, a good foundation like this. So, you know, just, just a, a point to drive home. If you modularize your, your setups, you know, don't make, 
you know, this nice 72 core CCR do everything. Um, there's lots of advantages to breaking up different functions of your routers. So, you know, Greg's going to talk about some of the redundancy early. Um, yep, Greg's up there. When's, when's your presentation? Tomorrow. So I kind of cut out some of the redundancy aspect of mine. Um, it makes it easier to upgrade, like I was talking about earlier. If you're able to take that router offline and it doesn't take down your entire network, that's a good thing. Or if you want to test something and you're like, well, I've tested this in the lab, but I need to test it in production. I need to see how it functions in production. And you're going to get better performance out of it. So, so here's some, some easy BGP tips. You know, say you have a new peer. Create you a, f a filter that just denies everything. Bring up that filter, apply it to your peer, and just bring up the session. A lot of BGP issues can be overcome if you just leave the peer up and maybe every 12 hours that peer goes down. Well, you're not sending any traffic over it. You're not sending any routes to them. Maybe there's a physical issue. Maybe every 12 hours they have to reboot their router. Um, you can uncover stuff like that. It's just sitting there attached to it saying, here I am. Um, and you can, you can kind of get an indication of how good that provider is going to be. Um, there, there's some new methods of thinking kind of floating around with uh, BGP. There's, there's some folks out there who are actually filtering out entire slash eights out of their routing table. And that, that kind of, you, you got to think about that because here's, here's the deal. Cogent, Cogent's a great example. Cogent owns the entire 38.0.0.0 slash eight IP space. Okay, I, I would bet anybody, whatever I have in my wallet for cash, which isn't a lot, but I'm, I'm on vacation. So I would bet anybody that if you had one routing statement that said 38.0.0.0 slash eight goes to this single peer, you're not gonna be able to reach everything on the 38.0 network. So why do you need it? Because in BGP, the more specific wins. If it has to choose between 38.0 slash eight and say, you know, 38.18.64.0 slash whatever that is, 20, it's gonna pick the slash 20. It's gonna follow that route. So if you filter out these slash eights, you're, you're not really gaining much as far as entries in your BGP table, but you are gaining processing power. You're gaining convergence time. And when you reboot a router or drop a peer or add a peer, convergence time is critical. So, and, and if, you're, if you know your network, know your peers real well, then you can say, well, I've been filtering out slash eights for a while. Maybe I'm going to filter out slash nines or tens, or, you know, maybe you want to get real aggressive and go, you know, eight through 12. So now you're dropping a fair amount of stuff from every peer that you have. Well, if you have five and six and seven and 10 peers, that adds up pretty quickly. So that makes your convergence time better, your route selection much better you know, much quicker. Um, there, there are some gotchas to it. Um, if anybody's trimming their routes on, say, an international link, um, unless you have a couple international links, it might not be, you know, too, too well for you. So you got to kind of pick and choose where you, where you do this. Um, you, just remember, the more specific is going to win. So this, this slash eight that's in my routing table, it's hardly ever going to win when, when things are picked. Now, yes, you have some companies that are doing summarization, but Cogent's a great example. Um, all of these networks are not in the same place. Good example is in Indiana. Most of the people in Indiana 
that have cogent IP space are 38.86.something. Well, as you can see, this is just one small screenshot from, uh, from a website that gives all the, uh, the prefixes that, that Cogent has. Well, 38.86, if you're in California, it, it has to find its way to Indiana. So it's not going to say, okay, I'm gonna find 38.0.0 slash eight first, and then go from there. It's gonna say, hey, I'm connected to six different ISPs. Which one can get me to 3886? So when we go back to our BGP filter idea, um, lots and lots of denies should be in your BGP filters. You're filtering out your own IP space, you're filtering out all the, uh, the non-routable IP space, you know, 192s, 10 dot, you know, whatever. Um, and then the, the thing that a lot of folks do because their, their ISPs do it is most ISPs these days don't accept anything smaller than a 24 as far as a BGP advertisement goes. So if all your ISPs are doing that, you should be doing the same. And, and you can get, you can get pretty, pretty crazy with this. Um, you know, you can have all kinds of regrep rules and, and things like that. Um, you know, my, mine on one of my public routers, my BGP filter list is probably over 150 lines long, and that's, I cut out quite a bit of stuff. So, along the, along the lines of, of peering and BGP, one of the things I kind of I kind of added this in at the last because I I've heard a lot of people just just the last couple days is you know all my traffic's going to Netflix, um, Google, YouTube, you know all this stuff. How how many of you are peering on an internet exchange at the moment? Okay, how many are you of you are at a data center that may or may not have an internet exchange? Okay, so here, here's the deal on internet exchanges. They're, they're a, what they call a public peering point. So if you get to a data center and that data center has an exchange, some of the biggest ones are Equinix, um, AM6, uh, there's, there's a couple others, but in an exchange, a good exchange is going to allow you to offload a lot of your, your traffic and it's just another BGP peer. So when you get to an exchange and say that exchange has Netflix, uh, Google, Akamai is one of the, the big content providers, say, say they're all on that exchange. Well, all of a sudden, now you can offload 50 to 80% of your internet traffic directly over the wire. It doesn't go through another provider. It doesn't transit a link that might be congested. It's, it's literally a physical wire that goes from you to a switch fabric to the endpoint. So the, the example for anybody in here who's you know, on the business side of things, the, the example I like to use is how many people would like to pay 27 cents a meg to offload their traffic to Netflix? How many people would like to pay 10 cents a meg for all this traffic that goes to Netflix? It, it, it becomes a great economy of scale. Now, it's, it's not, that, not that simple because depending on where you are, you have to get to that data center that has that exchange. Um, you may have to pay for a cross connect, but in the grand scheme of things, it's pretty lucrative. And we're finding that most of the ISP side of things, most 50 to 80% of their traffic is some sort of streaming traffic. And then, then you have private peering. So say you get to a data center that doesn't have an exchange but maybe Netflix is in the building or Akamai is in the building. Well, depending on the company, Netflix is a little, little more lofty on, you know, they want so much traffic to be able to direct peer with them, but it's all a negotiation thing. If you get to a data center and Netflix is the only one there, you can say, hey, you know, you're, you're here, 
let, let's just do this thing. And if you find the right people in the right mood, they'll say, well, we see you're doing 50% less of what we want, but let's, let's go ahead and do that. It's, it's beneficial for us, it's beneficial for you. You know, we're, we're wanting to be good, good internet citizens. So, you know, that, that's kind of, you know, the, the end of my presentation a little. I just wanted to, I know it's kind of a little bit all over the board, but I wanted, to, I wanted to give people enough different topics that, you know, someone might zone out from one, but the next one, hey, you know, this is exactly what I'm wanting to do. Here's some, uh, you know, some websites, and if people are on Facebook, there's some very active WISP groups on there. Um, a lot of a lot of ideas going ar around, and you know that's kind of why why I come to to these events just to just to babble my mouth really. Um, I, I I don't get to talk geek with with many people, but um, you know this is this is just kind of some some fun parts of uh, why why I like to come. So uh, questions, comments. Thank you, Justin. Comments. All right, get ready. Okay. I have got the same Xbox people on my network and they're driving me insane. Um, we're doing routed network, private IPs. I understand UPnP, but I'm not exactly sure what to turn on, where to turn on. I mean, most of the time we have new, say, ah, turn, off, turn off the HTTP on your router, plug it into port one, and then get your IP off our Microtik you know, client, and that takes at least one NAT out, and usually I don't hear any more out of them. Um, is it, what do you turn, where, where are you turning on UPnP? You turn it on the access point, on, on their client modem, where else? I mean, what, what, are we, what are we looking at? I turn it on as close to them as possible. So if you're, you know, if you're, if you're managing the router, um, turn it on on that router. Um, if they have a Linksys or something like that, I usually, I don't say anything because of the vulnerabilities. Um, you know, like I said, it's, it's a couple years old, but if they have a router that's a couple years old, they may have, you know, firmware that, that has some issues. So you want it to be able to, whatever their WAN IP is, whether it's a public IP or a private IP, you want that WAN IP to be able to traverse to the edge of your network without being natted or, you know, somehow molested in that way. So once it gets to the edge, as long as on the, that universal plug and play is being done, you know, if it's on their CPE, fine, but as long as it leaves that and nothing happens to it, that's the key. Okay, thank you. Next question. Go ahead, sir. Traffic Hi. Um, just a, a couple of observations with regards to BGP filtering. Um, if you're running a, a small set of peers, uh, you'll find that the bulk of your traffic is going to be coming from those peers, those transit providers. And instead of uh, necessarily filtering out the least specifics, uh, if you're worried about convergence and CPU and memory resource issues, uh, you may want to actually do is, is reverse that logic and filter out more specifics. Because what you find, the reason we're at 550, 600,000 routes, is we've got a bunch of people that think it's a really great idea to take net one, one slash eight, and de-aggregate it into a whole pile of slash 24s. Well, if you're in Indiana and you have a whole pile of slash 24s and they all go to level three, that's your route AS path half, then slash one slash eight is gonna get you the same place and you're gonna be consuming a heck of a lot less resource uh, and, and convergence uh, on there. Um, the second piece point I would, I would throw out is, as, a, as an added resource, those are some good points you had on the slides there, is that if you're looking at trying to figure out where to go peering, uh, there's a wonderful free, free isn't like free beer, um, free uh, website called peeringdb.com, P-E-R-R-I-N-G-D-B, like database, dot com, and you can see every exchange point, most of the peers at those exchange points, who to contact, what the peering requirements are, traffic mixes are, all of that. It is a absolutely wonderful free, as in free beer, tool. Yeah, and just a, just a comment on that. You, you have to be careful with filtering out too much. Um, you know, if you're just talking one or two peers that you have, you know, 
kind of kind of just letting everything flows whatever you want to do is a, a good thing um, once you start adding you know five six plus you know peers that's where that's where it gets okay I need to optimize this the best way I can and yet peering DB um, very very nice resource okay thank you next question hi I am by no means a CG nat expert uh, but I know that some people in our company are interested in it um, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on let's say we're a tier three and we could free up a slash 22 and we need to make a plan for the next 10,000 customers what are we going to do for the next five ten years on v4 what's your recommendation if not CG nat well CG nat if you follow the very specific outline of what that's why I put the the RFCs up there if you follow what the RFCs up there do then Kira grade nat will work um, it's it's not that much different than regular NAT, but in some instances, it will it will benefit. You know, if you're talking ten thousand customers, um, you know, if you're talking lots and lots of customers, that's why carrier gra carrier grade NAT was was implemented. You know, it, it was almost a sales thing. You know, Juniper and Cisco and those folks say, "Hey, how can we sell something new to our biggest clients?" Hey. Let's do this carrier grade NAT thing. Oh, okay. Let's let's publish some white papers and let's get it going. Well, if you follow the RFCs, um, you know, like the RFCs say, you have to use this very specific um, IP space. Uh, so as long as you're doing that, carrier grade NAT in a large environment can be beneficial um, for the the smaller, you know, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 user ISP it's not going to be a big, big deal. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? I've um, got a question regarding when you're natting uh, for your end users, regardless of the reasoning that you're doing it, um, <clears throat> we'd like to know if you have any experience or anybody in the room when the law enforcement comes, including FBI, and says, hey, we want to know who's behind this IP address. Yeah, that's that's one of the the kind of disadvantages of NAT. And if you push it closer to the tower, then you can say, okay, um, I I have to get down to at least the tower level to to find out where this person is. Um, you know, most of the time you can you can run some other scripts on the Microtik that says, hey, all of my you know my known. Uh, torrent users, all of my known peer-to-peer -peer users, I'm going to dump them into a list. So when someone comes knocking, I can say, okay, I know it's, you know, one of, one of these people. That, that's probably it. Now, when you're talking something more intensive than, you know, a, a DCMA takedown notice, when you're talking about a, a subpoena or something like that, it gets to the point where your network should be CALEA compliant. Once your network is CALEA compliant, it doesn't really matter if you're doing NAT, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, how you're handing out those IP addresses or what you're doing with those IP addresses. Um, that's what I worry about. I don't worry about, you know, Sony Pictures sending my customer a takedown notice. I worry about, um, you know, the FBI coming and serving me with a wiretap warrant or a CALEA warrant, two, two very different things. If they're serving me with a CALEA warrant, it's big time. So if my network is CALEA compliant, which is, a, which is a standard, if it's CALEA compliant, then I can say, hey, Mr. You know, Mr. FBI person, I'm CALEA compliant. You probably already know that. Where do you need to plug in? OK, thank you. Yeah, Dennis, Dennis knows something. Two things just to add to that. Uh, as far as the lawful intercepts go, there is currently no requirement in the United States anyway to maintain any data record of NAT transactions. So if you are doing that, there's nothing that you have to store legally or as far as a requirement. Uh, however, if you do get a subpoena or clear request, you can also get into a lot of trouble by giving them too much information. It is very, very, very important that you get your attorneys, et cetera, involved very quickly 
because if you sit there and say, I have one IP, they're requesting a wiretap or a, a lawful intercept for that, I have one IP with 200 clients behind it or 100 clients behind it, and you allow them to tap that, you can be very, very liable for many things such as uh, improper wiretap procedures, plus any data they get, all they have to prove is there's somebody else that was on it, and all that data gets thrown out in court. So it's very, very important that you handle that very carefully. Okay, thank you. Any more? Yes, Tom has a question. <laughs> Sorry, won't be able to understand Tom anyway, so don't worry about it. Just want to correct your pronunciation of routers. It's routers. <laughs> I know. I uh, just. Uh, just a quick one, uh, just in response to Dennis Burgess's uh, comment there about the data retention, in the likes of the European Union, they're always trying to bring in that type of data retention laws, so we actually have a six month minimum to a two year maximum retention. Now it's been thrown out by loads of constitutional courts, so the politicians keep trying to rewrite it so it becomes constitutional, but uh, it's, it's one of those things that I think it's only a matter of time before the US will have that type of uh, legislation in place. That's all. Reuters, just remember that. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. Thank you all. <laughs>